Hello, everyone. This is Pastor Brent. I uh, just want to thank you for tuning in uh, for this past Sunday's sermon. If you are watching on our app or through our website, or if you're listening through wherever you catch your podcasts, we're so happy that you're tuning in with us today. Uh, we just want to invite you uh, to take a couple minutes and fill out a Connect card, or if you want to give um, financially and partner with our ministry, right now is your opportunity to do that through the links below or the buttons below this video. Uh, we're going to start the sermon here in a couple minutes, but I just wanted to personally say thank you for tuning in. Thank you for partnering with us. We love you guys, and uh, we just pray that this message blesses you. We'll see you in a couple minutes. today good everybody awake the sun is out it's like negative two out but the sun's out come on this is Ohio you got to praise God about something so uh, everybody good today everybody feeling extra lovey or something I don't know I wore salmon today in honor of Valentine's Day so someone said earlier Brent you're in the festive mood and uh, I guess so. I don't know. I just grabbed it out of the closet. It felt like the right thing to do. So, Tim, thank you. <laughs> Tim Rezo, people. The man, the myth, the legend. So, uh, anyway, uh, excited to be here. Excited. I, 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 I want to reiterate uh, everything with the building. Uh, we are so excited. So we're going to have invite cards for you guys. Uh, coming out. I've been holding off uh, probably because my faith is small. Like God, God was uh, testing. I'm saying I, I was nervous that we're actually going to launch on Easter and God's saying, just go for it, right? Like we're committed to it. He's going to make it happen. So we're going to make invite cards and I'm going to pray to God this church is put back together. We did a great job tearing it apart. So if you've been up there, we ripped that mess apart. It's, that's the easy part. Just break stuff, right? How many are like, I'm a professional breaker? Like, give me a sledgehammer. I couldn't tell you how to build it, but I'll just knock. Me and John knocked a wall down that we now have to put back together because we got too excited. And uh, yeah, so some of you are like, you need supervision, Brent. Uh, I do. We, we, were, we were not even doing, I was not dressed to do demo work. We were sitting doing computer work, like, you know, white collar work. And there was a hammer and the coffee bar, and I just broke a wall. It just was the right thing to do. We just emptied out a wall. We emptied out another one, found there was a vent pipe in it and some electrical, and I ain't trying to move it. So we're going to rebuild that wall that we knocked down. So, uh, so it's good time. So come out, give us some super, Gary wasn't there this week. That's what's wrong. Gary's my, Gary and, uh, t and uh, Gary, Gary is showing up. He's saying, Brent, you're going to hurt yourself. Watch what you're doing. So uh, Gary Bunn, I, I blame you. So <laughs> just kidding. But uh, anyway, we're really excited. So be praying, be excited for launch and uh, invite someone out. Be thinking about Easter Sunday. That's usually an invite Sunday anyway. Uh, be ready to invite someone out to that service because uh, we're excited just to worship in that space. So um, it's going to be cool. So anyway, 
into our sermon. If you have your Bibles, uh, get those out. Uh, and if you don't have a Bible, steal a Bible, download a Bible, whatever you need to do, because uh, this series, we've been wanting you to highlight some things, um, connect with some things. Uh, we, we started this series last week called I See a Victory. And uh, every, I'm telling you, some weeks, Siri just wants to be involved in my sermon. And uh, it's big brother trying to listen in, make sure I'm not saying anything bad. And uh, anyway, but uh, here, here's that some of you are like the wheels are all turning in your head now, like it's the government. They're listening to you. <laughs> no, it's just that technology is crazy. And uh, anyway, so we started this series titled I See a Victory. And the premise of this series, if you were here last week or not, is what words, what phrasing, what, what stances are we taking? Are, are, we, are we taking a posture of defeat as the body of Christ, as the church? Or are we taking a posture that God has given us to say, to, to declare victory over the battles that are in front of us? And I think so often we're declaring defeat rather than declaring victory. We're, we're declaring oppression rather than saying, like, God's already given me ground in this area, and he's going to see me through it. And so last week, we've been going through some key principles in your life, some things that, that I believe you can build your life around that will help you see a victory in your everyday walk. And so last week we talked about the idea that, that you have been saved or you, you, you have been, uh, the, the price has already been paid. And if, if you remember last week, we talked about that illustration of a landlord showing up, a bad landlord you had, and they show up at your door and they're, they're trying to declare some things over you, but the price has already been paid. The, the, the debt has already been paid that you don't have to live under that bondage and oppression anymore. And so this week, we're going to continue that conversation, and every week, I have a, a verse or a couple verses that, that kind of surround this principle. This week, we're going to be in the book of Romans again, but I have a verse in 2 Peter I want us to read. 2 Peter, if you turn in your Bibles there, verse 1, this is where we are going to be. Chapter 1, verse 2. It says this, may God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Verse three, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him. So, so what he's saying is there's no price you have to earn. You don't have to show up and do anything. It doesn't matter how much you gave in the offering today or didn't give. God has already given it to you. If you have come to know him, if you, have, if you have been set free, right, back to last week's principle, if you have received salvation through the cross and resurrection, God has already given you everything you need. So the one who is calling us to himself by the means of his marvel, marvelous glory and excellence, and because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. There's a lot there. There's a lot in that verse about, about our lives and what we're striving for and what God's doing. And so last week we talked about there, there is a price that has been paid. There, Jesus paid the price to set you free. So you have been saved. And when you receive that salvation, God opens up the heavens on your life. says, I'm going to give you everything to strive toward righteousness. And you don't have to earn it. I, I, anyone ever had a job where, and I, and I know every job, like you're supposed to work hard and, and there's favor when you work hard and do things. But any, anyone ever had a job where every time you showed up, the pressure was on? Like you felt like I have to impress every, like you spent more time impressing people than doing the actual job. Anyone ever been in that scenario? I have. I, I worked at a country club for three years. You're like, Brent, country club? Man, I rocked the polo and the khaki shorts. I was a caddy. I can throw down. Some of you are like, Brent, let's play golf. I stink at golf, but I understand golf really good. I'm horrible. I play golf like, uh, like I'm Babe Ruth, just trying to murder the ball, so, which is a bad combo. And so, uh, and so I worked at this country club, and uh, in the country club, if you've ever been, there's, there's golf pros, right? And those are like the head guys that give lessons. This was a, a prestigious country club. 
And uh, I was a scrummy, scrubby punk rock kid uh, that, that my grandpa just got me a job at a golf course. And so every time I would show up, I would show up and, and uh, the, confession, this is side note, ADD moment. The reason I took the job is because uh, I would have to caddy and clean clubs and do all that stuff, but sometimes I'd get to go pick the range, and I'd just put on my music and just cruise in the car, just golf balls bouncing off. It is awesome. You just kind of lean back, get a nice like lemonade iced tea sitting up there, and just drive around picking up golf balls until you get the, the golf cart stuck in the mud. That's when it gets messy and people are like just golf balls swinging right by your head while you're out there trying to get it. Anyway, ADD moment. And uh, <laughs> if it's your first time, I'm sorry. <laughs> if you've been here a long time, you're used to it. So, uh, but, but here's the thing. So I, I spent three years at this job and, and I loved the job. It was a good job. I made a lot of money. Rich people showing up at a country club, man, whew, they will throw down. And, and I loved it. It was great. It was a great college job. But I remember spending three years trying to earn the favor of the head golf crow, Tom Atchison. And I remember Tom, he would show up and I'd, I'd run around and, and try to look good and know what to do. But, but here's the thing, because I wasn't a golfer, I was kind of separated from the class of, of my fellow workers because I couldn't have golf conversations or talk about my swing or what my, what, what, like how I, how I did on 18 last weekend. I'd be like, I didn't do 18 at all. But, I, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't indulge in the conversations that were happening. So, so every time I came to work, it was nothing more than me trying to earn the favor of the boss. And I remember for three years, it was a losing battle because I never could get into the inner circle. And I love that job, but, but let me tell you, even, even now I found out Tom, who was the head pro, is actually friends with Lauren Zance. And so sometimes he'll show up at family parties and I'll be like, Tom, I still do it. I'm 36 years old and I'm still trying to earn Tom's favor. Why do I tell that story? Because I think sometimes as Christians, we've been saved, but we find ourselves constantly trying to earn the favor of the one who saved us. And what 2 Peter is saying is that, that, that you don't have to earn that favor, that God freely gives it. He has opened it up upon you, upon salvation, and given you everything you need to strive toward righteousness. This morning, I want to talk about the concept of becoming holy, becoming righteous. What does it mean to step into that? So we know we've been saved. Uh, the, the theological, right, the churchy word is becoming sanctified, right? Some of you are like, I don't, I don't even know what that means. Let's go back to holy. I'm good there. But, but, but how, how do we strive in this process toward becoming more like Christ. And what, what does it mean? Because there's two aspects to this thing. There's two aspects to this thing of righteousness. Uh, the first one is, is you have been already made holy through the cross. Jesus has already positioned you. When you accept salvation, God says, you are my beloved, right? Like you step into the glory of God, the favor of God. And, and so you, you, we have to start there because I think sometimes in the church we run straight toward behavior modification, right? If there is nothing in your life to drive you toward becoming more righteous, then it's like me at the country club just trying to earn the favor. You have to realize that, that, that God looks upon your life and he says, you've already been positioned. Just like 2 Peter says, when you receive salvation, God looks at you and he opens up the heavens on your life. Church, you gotta, you gotta catch this because I think we've fallen into the problem in our, in our cush church world of thinking like, if I give enough, if I do enough, if I say, like we're, we're on this hamster wheel of trying to earn the favor of God. And just like the prodigal son coming back to the father saying, I'll, I'll be a slave for you. I'll go back into it. I'll do whatever I need. And, and the father says, I'm already putting the ring on your finger. It's already been given. Romans 6, we're going to be in the book of Romans, so if you have your Bible, turn there. Romans 6, verse 18, remember we did the first part of chapter 6. 
But, but, but Paul goes on to write in 618, now you are free from the slavery of sin. So when you accept salvation, when you go to the cross and say, Jesus, I'm giving you my life, what we talked about last week, when you go and you become free, you now become free to the slavery of sin. You, you, don't get, you can't get sold back into that. You can't, you can't run back in. You've, it, the price has already been paid. Now, there are behaviors that, can, that, that you can struggle with, right? There are things in your life, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But, but you have already been set free. You have already been positioned and made holy in the eyes of God. Church, you got to catch this. Because, because I talk to people over and over and they say, I just, I got to get saved every week. Like, so it's that, it's that I show up at church and we're going to do an altar call and every week I, I, I lied this week, got to get saved again, right? I, I, you know, I, I watched, you know, Tom Brady try to throw the Lombardi trophy. I feel like I sinned. I got to get saved again, right? Like, Well, whatever it is in your life, this struggle, right? Righteousness over here, but you have already been made holy. And so you have to realize that your position has already been established in the kingdom of heaven. It's not by your earning or your doing or your struggle or, or what you're walking through. God says, I've set you apart. You are in the kingdom. We can work through the mess of your life, but realize you have already been made holy. Have you ever been given a position that, that you feel like you didn't deserve? Or favor that you... It, it, the, 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 I remember Lauren and I, I, I think I've told this story before, but early on in our marriage when we had no money and West Palm Beach life. Some of y'all heard my West Palm Beach stories. Sketchy life we lived. I worked at Abercrombie and Fitch and she was in college, so we were broke. If anyone works in the mall, you know. I was a manager. Come on, I had benefits. That was the only rule Lauren's dad gave me. He said, you have to have benefits to marry my daughter. There was no Obama rule where you could be on your parents' benefits till 26. Some of y'all live in that good life. Back in the day, you had to go get a job to get it. So, and I, we were married and, and had no money, but a buddy of mine, he was a sound guy. And uh, he was on tour with, I'm not going to say who it is because y'all will judge me. And I don't need that judgment on Valentine's Day. But he was a sound guy for a prominent pop star. Very prominent pop star. And he invited us out to the Dolphin Stadium. Miami Dolphin Stadium said, I'm in town. You and Lauren come out. And uh, I remember pulling in. And he said, oh, come to the back gate. And so we went to the back gate. We roll in, park my uh, dilapidated Honda Civic next to some tour buses. I'm feeling like a baller, right? I went out and bought a guest shirt so I'd look fancy, right? <laughs> So we're like, who wears guests? What back in the come on, this is back in the day. And so it had gold foil on it. Come on. <laughs> Y'all are judging me right now. And I rolled into Dolphin. And man, we went in the back door. He ushered us in. And, and I remember we went down. He's like, come on, I'm taking you in. And we went down under the stage. And we're standing in this lady's dressing room. And Lauren's holding her microphone. And I'm like, if you drop that and break it, we're running because I can't afford to fix that. And we're like hanging out and he's taking us through all the secret compartments where she pops out of the stage and does all this stuff. And he said, okay, now I'm going to take you out to your seats. And I'm thinking, we're going to be sitting up any, come on, when I go to concerts, we're nosebleeding it, right? Or basketball games. Anybody, you're like, what? You get the fresh air because you're all the way up top. And I'm like, we're going all the way up, babe. And he says, no, no, no. I got good seats for you. And so we go, and he sits us in this section next to the sound booth. And all of a sudden, this the the celebrities manager comes and sits down right next to us. And then Alex Rodriguez walks in and Rod Stewart. And I'm like, oh my gosh, Lauren, what are we doing? I I literally had a moment. I, I don't, I don't belong here. Like I was, I'm like, I got scrubby jeans on and a gold foiled shirt. Like we are not in the right place. I am not, I didn't earn this position. And I remember sitting there and, and I, for half of the concert, I was just uncomfortable because these rich people, her manager and his supermodel wife, they're cute little kids trying to play with me. And I'm like, I shouldn't even be talking to you people. Like I don't deserve to be in this place. And the whole time I'm uncomfortable. 
And, I, and I'm sitting there, and I missed half of the concert because of my uh, unwillingness to receive the position that has been given to me. Church, so often I feel like as the body of Christ, it's like we, we, we live our lives like me sitting in the VIP section. We miss the glory of the moment. I mean, people were like bringing food and dr- whatever you want, sir. I'm like, I am not a sir. Give it to them. Rod Stewart, go give him some stuff. Come on. I'm like, I, we miss the glory of the moment or what God has for us because we don't think we deserve the position that he's given us. And church, I'm here to say that through the cross, from what, from what 2 Peter says and what Romans chapter 6, verse 18 says, you have already been positioned by God. You have been set free from your sin. You have been made holy in the eyes of God. Whether you deserve it or not, when you humble yourself and you fall at the foot of the cross and you say, God, I'm broken and lost and a sinner. I commit myself to you. God says in that moment, he says, you are my beloved. To whom I am well pleased. Receive all that I have. And you don't have to earn it anymore. Because the truth is, there's nothing you could do to earn what God has given you. There's no offering amount you could give. You could build the whole new building by yourself and it still wouldn't be enough to receive what God has given you. Because he says, I am well pleased with you. But just because you have been given the seat, and and here's the part we have to catch because there's two sides of this thing. There's a position that has been given, but there's also another aspect to becoming righteous and holy. It just, just because you have been given the seat doesn't mean there shouldn't be a desire to become more Christ-like or holy. So you've been positioned holy, but in that moment, there, there, there is a switch that happens within us that says, I, I'm not living, I, I've been set free from my sin, but I'm not living a slave to my sin anymore. Paul puts it like this in, in Romans chapter 6, and, and this is a good verse. I, I think if you're going to underline anything today, everyone get their phone out, get ready to mark this down, because this is something you should read every day. Romans chapter 6, verse 17. Paul puts it like this, this desire for righteousness. He says, thank God, once you were slaves to sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey the teachings we have given you. See, Paul's speaking to the, the church of Rome and he's writing this and he's saying that their, 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 their lives are messy because they don't know how to live for God. They've stepped into this new, new kingdom and, and they're trying to figure it out. And he says, you were once a slave to your sin, but now you've wholeheartedly obeyed the teachings we've given you. Verse 18, this is important. Now you are free from your slavery to sin and you have become slaves to righteous living. So, so, so Jesus sets you free, but in that moment, it doesn't mean like, oh, I'm free, let's live it up. I got the seal. It's like what Zach was saying, much has been given, so there should be a desire within you to say, I want to strive toward righteousness. And let me tell you, church, righteousness is a process. If you're like me, it's a very long process. Stretch that mess out like real long. I didn't get saved till middle school. Let me tell you, like, like come on now. Thank God, God is a graceful God and he stretches that process out. You were once a slave to your earthly desires. You were once a slave to serving yourself. And what Paul says is in that moment, you now become a slave to righteousness. There is a desire within you to say, God, you have saved me. You have made me holy. You you have called me into your kingdom. And now I want to give everything I have to become more like your presence. And I wonder if we were honest about our lives We love to receive the gift, right? 
We say, give me, come on, I want, I want the seat in the kingdom. But where, where a lot of us struggle is that desire toward righteousness. Because righteousness makes you sit and look at what you're filling your life with. Righteousness makes you examine what, what things you're desiring to fill, what drives you, what fills you up, what you're working toward. And what, what, G, what, what Paul is saying and what Jesus was teaching is that our only desire should be to give everything right to the kingdom of heaven. Remember the rich young ruler? He shows up, he says, I follow all the commandments, I'm perfect. I want salvation. And Jesus says, okay, you can be saved, but can you, can you change your life to desire to fill up your life with righteousness and what is holy, or are you just serving yourself? See, when we're saved, it transforms us. There is something that, that, that shifts within us, and we begin to ask this question. What is our drive and motivation for life? It's the process of sanctification, right? You've already been given the position, but then God begins to work through areas of your life, begins to transform your mind, begins to transform how you see the world. That's why, that's why we, we, we as the church, we, we want to see people get saved, but we don't like the messiness of sanctification because sanctification means, man, we're going to have connect groups, and that means we're going to get messy, and I'm going to walk with people, and I'm going to push them toward righteousness, and, and we're going to link arms and say, let's, let's walk together, and I'm going to pull you along sometimes, and you're going to pull me along sometimes. Let's, let's begin to look at what fills our lives up. But for many of us, we have a hard time laying those things down. Jesus has an interaction in John chapter 4. John chapter 4, Jesus, uh, if you know the story, uh, you can turn there if you want. I'm going to paraphrase it, but if you know the story of John chapter 4, Jesus shows up at a well. And he has an interaction with a woman, and, and there's a lot of question. It was the middle of the day, and, and, and that was not when women typically went to the well. And so maybe she was ashamed because she was a Samaritan woman to show up at a well. But, but there's also other theories that maybe she was looking for trouble, right? Because this woman had a past. She had a history. And she shows up at the well, and so, so uh, many scholars believe she, she might have been up to some promiscuous behavior. Nice way to put it. And so Jesus sends his disciples on, and it was almost like he knew, son of God, come on. He knew she was going to be there, and he shows up at the well, and he begins to have this interaction with this woman. And, and, and they begin to have this conversation about water. And, and, and Jesus makes this comment in the middle of it. He says, if you knew who I was, you would actually ask me for a drink of water. Because typically if a man would show up to the well, the, the woman would fetch the water, right? And, and Jesus was a rabbi. And, and he says, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for water, but not physical water, water that will eternally feed your soul. He's talking about that freedom piece, right? Being saved. He's saying you'd, you'd ask for it and you would, give, you would be established in the kingdom, right? If, it, if that water never runs dry, that means God gives it. Whether we deserve it, he just keeps giving and giving. Thank God for that, church. But the conversation goes on, and this is the part I want you to catch in John chapter 4. They start talking about water, and, 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 and it's kind of vague. It doesn't show a lot of the dialogue. And In John chapter 4, verse 10, he, he says, you'd ask for me. And uh, the woman goes on to talk about, she starts talking about the bucket and the well and all this stuff. And Jesus says, you're not catching me. And so then I love, man, we read Jesus like he's boring, Jesus was like, I mean, I'm sure he's son of God. He had to have some empathy, but he just called people out like savage style. 
Like, you got to read the Bible. Like, any of you all are all in your feelings all the time? You need to read Jesus because he's like, I'm just going to call it for what it is. And here we go. And so he's having this conversation with this woman. And he's talking about salvation and he's unpacking it. And Jesus calls this woman out. He says, go get your husband. And he's trapping her because Jesus is like, we've been talking about getting free. But now let's talk about what's filling up your life. Because it's not enough to become free. You will never achieve the purpose and call that God has on you if you don't begin to fill yourself up with his presence and you don't begin to strive toward the righteousness of who he's calling you to be. So he begins, he says, go get your husband. She says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus, like a savage, is like, yeah, that's right, you got five of them. Like, you guys are like, oh, Jesus would never be mean. Come on. Like, Jesus is like, drop the mic. You got five husbands. He just calls her out. Jesus isn't shaming her. He's calling out, what are you filling your life with? You, this woman, she, she had been filling her life up with, so imagine she had all these buckets around and this was her life. And she says, I need love from a man. I need acceptance. I want to feel good. I, 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 need, I need money, right? And so she's, she's going from man to man to man. She, she, she can get the, the living water thing, but when Jesus begins to unpack her life, that's when it gets messy. And he begins to unpack. These are all the things you're filling your life up with and you're missing the holiness that comes from God because you're putting the wrong thing into your bucket. Start emptying it out. And I thought if this was our building, I'd just start smashing buckets in here. Just wapa, wapa. Like some of y'all, listen to me right now. Some of y'all, you get the salvation part. You get the free from sin part. But this long process of sanctification, becoming more like Christ, this is where your struggle is. Because you have many jars in your life and you're just filling them with the wrong things and you're saying, man, why am I not seeing breakthrough in this area? Why am I not, why am I not changing? Why are my habits not growing? Why am I not putting, why are the right things not coming out? Because you're continually filling yourself up with the wrong stuff. You're like this woman saying, man, I'll get another man. And I'll get another man. And I'll get another man. And Jesus finally is like, you got to, let's just shatter that. Let's fill you up with living water. Let's change you and go and sin no more. Let's change the habits. This is the message of Jesus, right? The woman caught in adultery, thrown in the middle of the, of the temple. And she's butt naked in the middle of the temple in front of everyone. I just said that. And uh, they're ready to stone her. Jesus speaks very firmly to her after everyone leaves. And he says, get up and sin no more. Does that mean the struggle went away? No, but she was set on a path of righteousness. And every day when the wrong things come, you're going to dump that bucket out and you're going to say, God, give me a double portion. God, fill me up with more of your presence. Holy Spirit, come and renew my mind. What Peter, what second Peter is talking about, church, you got to catch this. What second Peter is talking about is saying, you're going to be tempted with the wrong things. You're going to be tempted to continually fill your life up to serve yourself. Like Peter, and man, they're, they're in unison, Paul. They're talking the same thing. What Peter's saying, become a slave to righteousness. Begin to fill yourself. God has already given you everything you need to conquer the trials the enemy will use to defeat you. Some of y'all want breakthrough in your marriage? You want breakthrough with your children? You want breakthrough in your finances? You want favor with your neighbors, with your coworkers? What do you fill in your life up with? Are you striving for righteousness? Or are you still a slave to your old ways? Church, this is messy. This isn't easy. You come get saved, right? That's easy, right? We we make that the hard part, like raise your hand, come. Man, come, just give your life to Jesus. Now the work begins on the other side. 
what do I need to change? What do I need to examine? Where do I need the Holy Spirit's grace and favor on my life? God, renew my mind, right? Re make a renewal of my mind. Transform my past. That's what the Bible says. That should be our prayer. Renew my heart. That's the process of righteousness. So two things. The first one is a reiteration of last week. Are you still living as a slave when Jesus has already set you free? I remember going to middle school camp and every summer at camp I'd get saved. I gotta go forward, oh my gosh. I listened to Blink-182. I gotta need Jesus. I burnt, I burnt more unchristian CDs in my lifetime than anything. I'd go to acquire the fire, they'd be like, go burn them. I'd be like, oh, I got Jesus. Right? And then I'd feel like I need to get saved again because I'd be like, well, well, go back, you know? You've been set free. Walk in the freedom, walk in the grace. God has put his seal. That doesn't mean live how you want, but that means step into this presence. But the second part is, what's filling up your life? Are you a slave to your sin or are you a slave to righteousness? Because becoming more Christ-like means righteousness. It's the process. I've been, I'm 36 years old. I got saved in seventh grade at a camp called Big Prairie down by Columbus, Ohio on nasty orange carpet in a barn that was half falling down. Cried my eyes out. Jesus wrecked my life. All these years later, I'm still striving toward righteousness. God is still working things out in my heart. And I'm still saying every day, God, I'm not going to fill myself up with what filled me yesterday. I want more of your presence to conquer today. Let's make that our prayer. Receive the gift of salvation, but step into righteousness. That's all we have to do. It's the message the world needs. Your life will be a testimony toward his goodness. Let's walk. Let's strive for it. Let's stand together. I don't do this all the time, but I feel like it, it's appropriate today. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you came into this place and and I'm talking about the positional, like these, this idea of God establishing your position in the kingdom of heaven. And you would say, man, I, 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 I get it. I don't feel, I, I haven't given my life. I, I haven't submitted my life to Jesus. This morning's your morning. And I don't, I don't want to move just straight toward the righteousness side without, without the, the gift of salvation, right? If that's you this morning, you said, I've never given my life to Jesus. I haven't submitted my life fully at the foot of the cross to receive the, the, the gift of freedom from slavery. I'm living a captive to my own ways and to this world. If that's you this morning, I don't want to embarrass you, but I just want to pray for you. If you just lift up your hand, I want to pray for you this morning. Put it back down. God is knocking on your door. This is your moment. Jesus, you see these hands. You see these hearts. God, it's not something that they can earn. It's not something that they even deserve. But the gift of salvation is something you freely give. And God, right now I pray that, that there would be a moment of submission where the people in this room would say, not my will, but yours now, Father. They would submit their lives to say, I am a sinner and I'm only free because the grace that you've given through the cross. 
And right now they would submit their lives to your ways. God, they would receive the position that you have called them to. They would receive the gift of salvation in the name of Jesus. But God, right now, for every other person in this room, we don't need to raise hands because the the process of righteousness is a struggle for all of us. It's something we are all working through. And so God, I pray right now, more grace, more favor. God, I pray your the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God, the grace that comes from the Holy Spirit. God, the encouragement that comes from the Holy Spirit. That that the Spirit would fall upon our lives. That it would begin to work through the areas. What are we a slave to? Are we a slave to our past desires? Are we a slave to our old ways? Or have we completely submitted and stepped in and say, I am now a slave to righteousness. I want to become as much like Christ as I can. My life is a mission to point people to the Father and, and, and to live like Christ in every way. Begin to empty out buckets in this place. God, I pray right now that people that have lived in captivity and slavery would begin to empty things out figuratively in this place. They begin to lay things down. God, they begin to lay things at your feet and would begin to get filled by your presence. That they would begin new eyes and new ears and a new path. And, and that we would all begin to step into the righteousness you have called us toward. And God, we would begin to live the purpose you have called us to. God, that we would point more people. You gave us one mission. All the world would know who Jesus Christ is. And that more people would be saved through the cross. And so God, right now I pray that we would all step into that. In Jesus' name, amen. Because I'm going to see you.